U.S. economic growth statistics for the last fiscal quarter are revised downward on a Saturday where they could bury it inside the sections of the newspaper. Is the government playing funny with the numbers? I'm Alan Barton. Stand by for the front page. Joining me from New York is Dr. Lawrence Parks, Executive Director of the Foundation for the Advancement of Monetary Education. Dr. Parks, pleasure to have you with us. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Over the weekend, the Commerce Department quietly slipped out numbers, revising its GDP growth figures downward for the last quarter of 2010 from 3.2% down to 2.8%. Eight. This does not uh, harbor well for claims of economic growth. Now, this isn't the first time that commerce has downgraded the growth numbers. Uh, tell us what's going on here. Why were they downgraded? And are these the numbers that we really should have our eye on in the first place? Well, the more important thing is that these are not relevant numbers. And this whole notion of the gross domestic product, the gross national product, this is what people spend. And really, the strength of the, of the economy is not what people spend, but what they have. It's really a balance sheet issue, and the balance sheet is bust. First, the, these gross domestic product numbers, gross national product numbers, uh, they are inflated by so-called inflation. So as prices go up, it looks like the economy is doing better from their point of view, when in fact it's just the opposite. Now, a few years back, you wrote a book entitled, What Does Mr. Greenspan Really Think? How would you conspare, uh, compare Greenspan's reign as Federal Reserve Chief to uh, current Chief Ben Bernanke's? You know, that book was really an, anal an analysis of, a, of an important lecture he gave in Belgium in 1997, where he raised issues that no other Fed chairman had raised, such as the subsidies that we provide to the banks, uh, the fact that the whole fiat system is unstable, uh, the fact that if you subsidize the banks, they will act, in his words, reckless and irresponsibly. The problem with that uh, lecture was that the whole lecture was in Fed speak. And what that book does was, is to translate the Fed speak into plain English so you can see what he's saying. And in fact, uh, afterwards, uh, I guess about a couple of years later, I spoke to him. I said to him, why don't you talk about this more? This is really important. And he said to me in a very dejected way, looking at the ground, shaking his head, he said, nobody wants to hear it. Hmm. Uh, now, getting back to the current situation, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the inflation rate last year was 1.6 percent. But you've provided us with an interesting chart showing a personal consumer price index of common goods you happen to use. Why don't you help us make sense of these numbers? Well, you know, I buy a lot of the stuff off the internet, and I buy it a year in advance because it doesn't spoil. And I just happened to notice this time when I ordered things like toilet paper, shampoo, shaving cream, uh, razor blades, everything's up double digits. Forget about this business with the inflation rate being 1.1 or whatever they call it, percent. I mean, the rule of thumb is that the, if the monetary authorities are talking, if their lips are moving, they're lying. And so everyday experience for everyone is that none of these numbers make sense. Here in New York, for example, uh, they just raised all the mass transit fares, something like 11 percent to 18 percent, depending upon where you live. But in fact, what people don't understand is that these fares are subsidized. And the subsidy comes from taxes. Taxes is not in the CPI. So in effect, what's happened is that the uh, money creation is really increasing the entire cost structure of the nation, uh, making us unproductive, depreciating the purchasing power of people's savings, and more importantly, that which has been promised to them for future payment, their pensions. Noel, if the government numbers are suspect and if their lips move and they're lying, how is it that the average citizen can make rational economic decisions? Not, all, uh, not everyone is as sophisticated, certainly, as you are in terms of being analyzed. Uh, how would, do they keep their own personal indexes in that case? Actually, people are having a very difficult time with this. And you know, it's part of society. You want to believe in your institutions. It's like I don't come to you 30, 40 years later, tell you, you know, your parents have been lying to you all this time. And so again, people want to have faith. And in effect, uh, uh, ordinary people are having a terrible time with this. The principal beneficiaries of this whole system are the financial sector. 
And this is a direct result of all the irredeemable paper ticket money, all created of nothing, not in accordance with our Constitution. And they've really subverted the entire society. And again, what's in danger here are everybody's savings, everybody's pensions, annuities, insurance. Uh, it is a, a disaster. And there's only one person at the national level who's paying any attention to this, and that's our hero in the Congress, Dr. Ron Paul. Well, Warren Buffett released his annual shareholders letter this week, and he seems uh, a bit more optimistic. Let's look at what he says. He says, the prophets of doom have overlooked the all-important factor that is certain. Human potential is far from exhausted, and the American system for unleashing that potential remains alive and effective. America's best days lie ahead. All right, well, is this uh, pie in the sky or possibly realistic, just meant to be encouraging? What do you think? Well, I'd like to think that our best days lie ahead, but there's a lot of important changes that have to be made. Warren Buffett, as I'm sure you know, is pretty much an, uh, a major factor in the financial area. And to give you a feel for how much these folks have prospered, if you go back to 1980, not so long ago, the money supply, M3, this is a statistic provided by the Federal Reserve, not published anymore, was about $2 trillion. The market value of all the equities in America uh, was roughly a trillion, and the financial sector component of that was 5 percent, roughly 50 billion. You zip ahead to, say, 1990, excuse me, to 2007, and now the money supply, all created flat out of nothing, has grown from roughly 2 trillion to something like 13 trillion. The market cap of all the stocks have grown to something like 19 trillion, up from 1 trillion. But here's the key number. The financial sector component has grown from something like 50 billion to something like 4 trillion. Forget about the bonuses. Think stock options. These people have gotten fantastically rich. Buffett is primarily a, a good example of this. And they don't even know what to do with their money. And they're buying 40,000-foot houses in multiple locations around the world, 200-foot boats, uh, $100 million airplanes. There was an item in the news uh, a couple of years ago. These five bankers went out for dinner, spent $52,000 for dinner, $62,000. What, what do you buy for $62,000? And what is it that these people provide to society that they should be rewarded like this? I mean, no wonder Warren Buffett is, uh, you know, pra praising this whole system. It's not, this is not good, by the way, for the millions of airline workers, textile workers, auto workers, and other people who have lost their jobs. All right, thank you so much. That is Dr. Lawrence Parks of the Foundation for Monetary Education. You'll find more of his commentary at fame.org. And joining me now in studio is Terry Jones, Associate Editor for Investors, Business Daily, and Yaron Brook, President of the Ayn Rand Center for Individual Rights and a Forbes columnist. All right, guys, first off, what do you think of what the doctor said? Uh, anything you agree with or disagree with, Yaron? Well, I think much of his analysis on inflation and so on uh, was correct. The, the idea that these are government numbers and they're fuzzy, to say the least, is absolutely right. I mean, the inflation numbers are completely wrong as they're being reported. Uh, and uh, the real danger here is the huge expansion in monetary policy that we've seen over the last few years. I, you know, I would, I would question his last comment uh, about, uh, you know, demonizing the wealthy again. Now, th there is a certain element of truth here that I, I believe, and, and I think you can show this economically, that all these regulations and all these controls and all the government interventions has an impact on reducing the, the mobility of the poor. The poor have an inability to become wealthier. They get stuck in poverty. And that some people in the rich, if you're in the right industry, grow richer. So, yes, yeah, some people have been they're growing, richer, they're growing richer because of government because policy. Because of government policies. And, and, and well, I think what he's saying is that there's going to be a resentment against those people, a class resentment against people who benefit from it. Except the, they're identifying the wrong problem. Yes, right? the problem is government intervention. Let's blame the politicians. Let's blame the regulations. Let's blame the government regulations. Let's not blame the people who happen to be in an industry who is benefiting from it. I think, I think there is some truth that as a truly free market, finance would play a smaller role. I think finance is such a huge industry because it spends most of its trying, time getting around the uncertainty created, created by government policy and by monetary policy. All right, let's move on to today's news. Unemployment statistics just released by the Labor Department show a seasonally adjusted unemployment rate of, yes, just under 9%. Of 
course, this is the government. When their lips move, it's a potential they are lying. We'll take, we'll take a look at that. Yet, you see from the chart here, when you add in short-term discouraged worker, the rate is more like 16%. Adding in long-term discouraged workers pushes the number over 22%. And then there's a double secret super probationary <laughs> unemployment that's not even on the graph. It's not even on the graph. It's a special one that Dean Wormer has. Um, so Terry, uh, we'll go to you. What do you think in terms of the what the government is reporting versus what is real in terms of the experience of uh, Americans out there in the workforce? Well, again, it's you know we we were just talking about it. The statistics oftentimes don't tell the, the true story, uh, and these numbers have been changed so often. The definitions have been changed. You go back and they uh, they sort of cleverly excluded a lot of the longer term uh, discouraged workers from the measure. So of course the unemployment rate looks lower than it than it actually is. Uh, the fact of the matter is the economy is not producing enough jobs. We've created 300,000 jobs since November, and yet we've got a, a full one percentage point drop in the unemployment rate. That should tell you something's amiss with these data. Uh, the, the, the numbers are you know, a, a little bit crazy right now, largely because the, uh, nobody knows who's creating jobs and who's not. They, they don't uh, track that well at the government level. And at the end of the day, even uh, Friday's very good number, 222,000 private sector jobs, is not enough to make up the slack in the economy. It will take us years to uh, make up the 8 million jobs we've lost. All right, let's look at what the president says. Obviously, the state is in charge of collecting the numbers, in charge of disseminating the numbers, and improving the numbers. So here's how President Obama says all these numbers add up. And we know these numbers can bounce around from month to month. But the trend is clear. We saw 12 straight months of private sector job growth. That's the first time that's been true since 2006. The economy added 1.3 million jobs last year. And each quarter was stronger than the previous quarter, which means that the pace of hiring is beginning to pick up. Yaron, does he have a point? Well, after the uh, you know, the government destroyed uh, millions and millions of jobs. Yeah, the private sector is finally starting to slowly, very, very slowly, start hiring back some of the people that were laid off. M some people are starting new businesses. But this is very tentative. It's very slow. Given the decline and the, the, the steepness of the decline, what we would have expected in a healthier economy, a much stronger bounce back. And I would argue that the only thing holding back that bounce back are government policies. So it is, you know, government doesn't create jobs, but government sure can destroy them. And government dictates in a sense, by, by holding the reins on how fast they can grow. And right now, they're growing slowly because government won't let them grow fast. What, what private businessmen need is the knowledge that they, will be, that they won't be as badly regulated, they won't, their controls will be less, that they will be taxed less, that they will be freer to actually pursue their businesses in the future. That's what creates the confidence to, to build a business and create jobs. Terry, going back uh, to what Dr. Parks was saying about the inflation rate and sort of his own personal CPI based on goods that he uses. What do you think of what he, the doctor was saying in relation to what the government reports with regard to uh, inflation? Yeah, inflation, uh, the inflation number is, a, is a, a, a very deceptive number. One, one example, the inflation number treats housing as if you bought a new house every month. That's how it treats it. It, it acts as if you, you went out and bought a house. No, of course, none of us have. So over the last year and a half, with housing prices plunging, the inflation number has looked very, very weak because it pretends you're going out and buying a house every month. Well, no, as a matter of fact, I bought a house in 2006, and I'm Good stuck, with, I'm stuck <laughs> with a pretty big mortgage, and it's not going down. Uh, so, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is nonsense. But the, uh, the number, the, the headline number, shows actually rather tepid uh, inflation. Well, what do we do about the fact that the government clearly has a vested interest in reporting good numbers? I mean, uh, is there a, a, a history of these being viable numbers that you can really believe in and that the government goes, oh, my God, look, this independent group within the government has reported we're not doing such a good job? Or do you feel that that line is getting more and more blurred? I'll, I'll stay with you. Well, I think the line is getting a, a lot more blurred. And, and uh, ultimately, I mean, who, who is it who benefits from having high inflation? I mean, let's, let's ask ourselves. It's debtors. Yeah. Oh, who is the largest debtor on earth? Mm -hmm. The U.S. government, 14 trillion and counting. 
So they have a very big uh, interest in having a kind of a submerged hidden inflation that will erode the value of their debts over time and make it easier for them to pay them off. And that's one of the reasons why they're running such an irresponsible monetary policy right now, in my opinion. I think they're, they're monetizing the debt, in essence. They're turning, they're turning debts into cash. And, and, the, the, and inflation is a tax. Let's remember it is a, it's, it's a way to pay back the debt, right? But it's a tax. It's a hidden tax. It's a double, double, whatever, <laughs> double, 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 super <laughs> secret uh, <laughs> hidden mm -hmm. tax. But it is a tax. And, and when they hide the number, they're hiding the real tax rate that we all feel it in a declining standard of living. But, you know, we won't know what to attribute it to exactly. And that's how they get away with it. All right, gentlemen, that's all the time we have for you. Your is buying us a $52,000 dinner. we got to get to it. <laughs> Viewers, we want to add your voice to the mix. Are you a short or long-term so-called discouraged worker? And when do you intend to cheer up and how? Is your personal consumer price index going up faster than this 1.6 that the government is reporting? Click the comment button below. Join the discussion. For your own Brooke and Terry Jones, I'm Alan Barton. You've been watching Front Page.